All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. To Martha, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Before we begin our study of God's word this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we're thankful that we have this opportunity to study your word, to be informed about things that you have planned for the future, to come to understand a biblical framework for history, and to understand that there will indeed be resolution uh, in the future in terms of judgment, in terms of unrighteousness and righteousness. And Father, we pray that as we study these things that you will uh, help us to understand them. And though they are not directly applicable to us, there are implications that are important for our own lives in this church age. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're in Matthew chapter 24. And this morning what I want to do is complete what I started last time when I finished the, um, by introducing the parable of the fig tree that is crucial for understanding what is happening within this, this particular passage. But in the middle of that, there's this interesting phrase that comes along in, in um, verse 34 where Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. And I finished with a quote from Hal Lindsey, kind of leaving you hanging a little bit for uh, the rest of the story, because there are many who have been influenced by not only him, but many other what I would call popular prophecy uh, teachers. And they have taken this view that this generation is the generation that sees the reunification, or for, or ex, excuse me, the return of, of the Jews to Israel, the restoration of the modern state of Israel in 1948, or the return of, um, uh, the restoration of Jerusalem, the reunification of Jerusalem in the Six-Day War in June of 1967. This year is the 50th anniversary of that. So there's some interesting things. I'll send out a link before long, but uh, CBN has produced a feature film that from the, um, uh, from the uh, trailer that I have seen looks fabulous, but it is taking one of the, I believe, one of the paratrooper brigades and, and reenacting. It's a sort of a docudrama of the of the six day war and following them up onto the temple mount the recapturing of east jerusalem and the return of the western wall and the temple mount to uh, israel's possession so this is an interesting time now if though either one of those dates were the beginning of these signs and a generation was 40 years which is what many people say then we would be in the tribulation now the rapture would have occurred. And so how are we to understand this generation? This brings up several issues related to several other key things that Jesus says in relation to the parable of the fig tree. The main idea, as we will see, is that this generation, once we identify what this generation is, they're the focal point of the commands that come up or the exhortations to watch, to be prepared, and to be ready. If the, this generation is the generation that begins to see these signs and those signs occur now in the church age, then we're to watch and be ready, and it's talking about the rapture. If the, this generation is the generation within the tribulation, the tribulation, 
then these passages are talking about the second coming of Christ, which is what has been the focal point up to this point, and not the rapture. And among dispensationalists, uh, that is the prominent view, although there is a vocal and growing minority that take the view that this is going to be talking about uh, the rapture. So what I want to do is a brief review of a few key things to remember. Secondly, address the meaning and significance of the parable of the fig tree. Address the question of the meaning of the phrase, this generation. And then following that, where there's a comparison made with the time of Noah. And, that, um, and then following that, you have these statements about a per two people are in a field, one is taken, another is left behind. Many people think that's the rapture. Well, what exactly does that mean? Who is taken and who remains? So as we look at the first issue of key things to remember, what I want to do is remind you of some of the things that we've studied. First of all, we have to keep in mind that this is Jewish background. Matthew is written to a Jewish audience. Matthew says very little, as I pointed out last time, about the church. The word church, ecclesia, has only occurred two times in the Gospels, both in Matthew, but only one has the technical sense of the church. No content is given. No teaching is given. At this point, the disciples know nothing about the church or the church age. Second thing is that all of the events described in verses 4 through 31 take place within the seven-year period of the tribulation or Daniel's 70th week. Now, I spend a lot of time covering why that was so. Sometimes people think that I'm mired down in these details, but I do it for a reason, because if you take the views of several dispensationalists that some are part of verses 4 through 14, are occurring in this time. For example, uh, seeing wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines and all of those things. If that that we see today is what is talked about there, then we could be that generation that sees these things. But if those things are all within their unique, distinct wars, famines, earthquakes, if that's within the seven years, as I pointed out, then this generation who sees these things is talking about those within the seven-year uh, tribulation period. And if you remember, I pointed out that there is a parallel between what is described in verses 4 through 8 and called the beginning of sorrows and the seal judgments of Revelation chapter 6. Third, Matthew 24, 27, Jesus describes the circumstances surrounding his return. That's the second coming. He comes to the earth. And what he describes when he talks about the fact that the, that the um, uh, sun is darkened, uh, uh, moon doesn't give its light. That's in verse 29. Sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. That is clearly day of the Lord description from Amos, from Joel. However, the term day of the Lord is not used. Now that seems technical, but what happens is you will hear this from some people who are arguing that the rapture occurs in the second half of the chapter, that what is here that is imminent, using the thief term, uh, the, the thief analogy, that this is the day of the Lord, because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul talks about the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. But I pointed out in our study of the day of the Lord that there's a broad reference, which would include all of the tribulation, but in most of these passages that talk about, and all the passages that talk about the sun um, being dark and the moon not giving its light, that's all just the final, final few days, if not two or th only two or three days, probably no more than a week, the final, final, final part just before Jesus returns. So that limits in those passages, day of the Lord, to the end of the tribulation period. But the point is that when Jesus begins to talk in verse 36, but of that day and hour no one knows, those who say that that day equals the day of the Lord have no textual basis for that. Because in the Old Testament, whenever you see that day describing the day of the Lord, 
there's always a precedent within the passage. The day of the Lord is already mentioned either earlier or a little bit later, so that when they say afterwards that day, it refers to the phrase day of the Lord. Jesus never uses the phrase day of the Lord, so claiming that is really reading other passages into this text when it's not uh, justified. A fourth thing to remember is what I covered last time, that there are key differences between the rapture and the second coming. Now, a key principle of interpretation that I talked about last time was consistently violated in these a lot of studies, especially when the contrast is between pre-trib and post-trib, where they see certain similarities. Jesus is returning. There talks about parousia, which is a general, not a technical term for his coming. Uh, clouds, angels, trumpet. If any of those things are mentioned, that even though the details may be different, there is the assumption that because there are similarities, there are differences. And I talked about these illustrations. There's a difference between a car and a truck, a difference between a bush and a tree. It's not the similarities that are important. It's the differences. It's those details that are significant. Also, I talked about the difference between a jet fighter and a transport plane or cargo plane, difference between a daffodil and a sunflower. It's the differences, the details that are important. Then we covered a variety of differences between the rapture and the second coming. I'm adding one to that list today, and that is number 14. I covered 13 last time. Let me get back here. Christ gathers believers to meet him in the air. There is a gathering. And that's described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17, that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and together uh, shall be caught up with, him, with them in the clouds, and thus we will be with the Lord forever. However, in Matthew 24, 31, a passage that many will take as the rapture that... Uh, reads when the, um, did I get that verse right, 2031, uh, no, yeah, um, excuse me, I turned the wrong page, I'm in chapter 25, and he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four corners, four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other, and there are those who will say that's the rapture. Well, if that's the rapture, then we're talking about a rapture at the end of the tribulation. But there are definite differences. Uh, there, we meet the Lord in the air in First Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17. This passage talks about the angels regathering the elect, the saved Jewish believers of the tribulation period, and returning them to Israel. These are seen in passages like Jeremiah 16, 14, and 15 where we're told by the Lord, Therefore, behold, the days are coming in the future, says the Lord, that it shall no more be said, The Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, looking back to their restoration to the land at the time of the Exodus. But, he says, The Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. What will happen in the future is they will look back to another event where the Lord restored them from all over the world, that is the regathering that occurs at the end of the tribulation period. For I will bring them back into the land which I gave to their fathers. Isaiah 27, 12, and 13 is significant because it mentions a trumpet with this particular thing. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will thresh from the channel of the river to the brook of Egypt, and you will be gathered one by one, O you children of Israel. So it shall be in that day, the great trumpet will be blown. They will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria, and they who are outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. That's talking about the future return of elect Israel. That's not talking about anything going on today. It's talking about this miraculous return then the angels gather the elect together. Okay, that's our review. Now, what's the meaning and significance of the parable of the fig tree? Well, we have to remember the question that is being answered. The disciples have just heard Jesus say that the temple is going to be destroyed. Not one stone will be left on another. And they ask him two basic questions. When will this happen? 
and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? So it's talk, they're asking from a Jewish perspective about Jewish issues, the, uh, re, the, the destruction of the temple and the time when the Messiah will come and establish his kingdom. Nothing here is related to the church, the church age, or the rapture. So he's talked about the sign in Matthew uh, verse uh, uh, 24, verse 27, for as the lightning come from the east and flash to the west, so also be the coming of the Son of Man be. And that is the sign. Uh, verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Notice, sometimes some things don't hit me right away, but I was reading a, another passage related to a peripheral issue, and it really hits me in all these verses, in the parallels, it uses the title Son of Man again and again and again. That comes from Daniel 7. Daniel 7 uses the term, Daniel is looking into the future when the Son of Man will be given the kingdom by the Ancient of Days, and he immediately comes to the earth. So this is clearly second coming passage. He doesn't have the kingdom yet. It's not given to the Son of Man until just prior to his return to the earth. So we're not in any uh, form of the kingdom right now, but it reinforces what I'm saying here because we will see this Son of Man terminology in related passages that make it clear this is not and won't be talking about the rapture. It's talking about the Son of Man receiving the kingdom, coming to the earth to establish his kingdom. So he gives the parable. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. Now he could have used any tree. He's not making a point out of the fact that this is a fig tree versus a sycamore tree, but I think the fact that he can he uses a fig tree which is a symbol for Israel is an indication that he's talking about God's plan for Israel. He's not talking about the church. Now he's not making a point out about that, uh, of that, but the fig tree it has been used by him to symbolize judgment on Israel. And so that's in the background of this, of this imagery. In the spring, the, and we see this with other trees now. The uh, trees begin to put forth little, little, little sprouts, and the leaves come forth, and we know spring is here, summer is near. That's his, that's his basic point here, that you can tell what is going on. Now, this is a parable. As I pointed out last time, the word parable in the Greek is a broader term than what it means in English. But it's a, generally a broad term for some kind of illustration where something in the realm of reality is taken, some story is told, to compare and to instruct uh, about something in the unseen or spiritual realm. So the purpose of a parable is to give instruction. Sometimes it was uh, given in a parable form to sort of cloak what was being said so that only those who understood the keys to the parable uh, would understand. Then Jesus would tell his disciples what each part uh, that had significance meant. And so the parable here just simply says when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Now let me give you a couple of points about interpreting parables. First of all, unless parables are specifically connected one parable doesn't interpret another parable. reason I say that is we'll see this a little later on in Matthew uh, chapter 25 when we talk about the parable of the talents, that there is a parallel uh, similar, the parable of the minas in Luke 19, and there are those who, because there's similarity, they will use Luke 19 to help them interpret the parable of the talents. That's not justifiable. Now, if you have two parables that are given one after the other, where one builds on elements in the previous one, that's different. But what I'm talking about here is going to another book, another context to take a parable and then use it to interpret another parable. Second, two extremes to avoid is overgeneralizing a parable on the one hand 
and second, to try to make every detail of the parable mean something. Jesus usually tells us what the point is and describes which elements of the parable have significance for the point that he is making. So we don't want to under-interpret or over-interpret the parable. Third, the parable must be interpreted in the light of the immediate context first and then in terms of the context and argument of the specific book. There are many times when people come along and take parables completely out of context and use them for whatever reason or purpose they want to, and it just sort of free floats, and it doesn't have anything to do with the original context in which it was given. So uh, we have to interpret in terms of the immediate context and then the context and argument of the specific book. And since the immediate context here is talking about uh, Israel and the return of Jesus at his second coming to establish his kingdom, then we must interpret this in that light. And in terms of the context and argument of the book, this is a Jewish book talking about the kingdom and the, and the establishment and then the postponement of the kingdom. I mean, the offer of the kingdom and then the postponement of the kingdom, so that must uh, in, inform our meaning, our interpretation. Now, learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Now, in verse 33, I want you to notice something. He is talking to the disciples, but he's really talking through the disciples to those who will see these things take place. They won't. He says, so you also, when you see all these things, not some of these things, not just you know wars and rumors of wars and an increase in famines and pestilence, but when you see all these things, know that it is near. What is the it? The it is the second coming to establish the kingdom. It's not talking about the rapture. And there's an indication that, and it can't be talking about the rapture because then the rapture would, um, the people, then the rapture would be at the end of the tribulation because the people who are seeing it would be waiting for the rapture. So since the rapture, uh, this is talking about uh, the rapture occurs before the tribulation, church age believers won't be witnessing the, these things, these signs that are all take place within the seven year tribulation period. So he says, so you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near the doors. So question, what generation is he addressing? He's addressing the generation that will see all these signs. That's not you and I. We're not, we're not seeing that yet. We're not within the tribulation. So then he says, Assuredly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. So what is the meaning of this generation? Well, as I showed you last week, uh, this quote from Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey, he takes this view that has been it's been very influential for people to date set. Now, date setting has never been part of dispensational theology. Date setting was part of historicism. Historicism, if you remember, is the view, the idea that I can look at the current events and figure out where I am between Revelation 4 and Revelation 19. And unfortunately, in the, especially in the earlier years, of dispensational theology, many were still influenced to varying degrees by some historicism. So they would identify certain things and try to figure out what the, quote, signs of the times were and how close we might be to the rapture. That is borrowing from another system. I think in the last 20 or 30 years, a lot of work has been done by dispensational scholars recognizing that that's a problem and we need to be pure futurists. 
that all of this is in the future. None of it is being seen in terms of current events. So anyway, uh, we see from this that uh, Howe's interpretation was that 1948, the fig tree first put forth its leaves. Jesus said, this is the last paragraph, that this would indicate that he was at the door ready to return. Then he said, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. He says, what generation? Obviously in context, the, the generation that would see the signs. That's true. We would agree with that. It's the generation that sees the signs. But he says, chief among them is the rebirth of Israel. We don't see that anywhere in the passage. That's not what, what is being talked about. So his reading things in there came to the conclusion that 1948 was the beginning. Forty years was a generation. That would be 1988. Seven years earlier would be 1981. I guess we missed the rapture. Later, I think he and I know others shifted it to 67. Forty years later would be 2007. The rapture would have occurred in 2000. Oops, we missed it again. See, date setting's a problem because no one knows when the rapture will occur. No signs are necessary before that. So this phrase, this generation, has been basically interpreted three ways. First of all, that this generation was addressing the first generation Jew. Now, two groups take this view. First of all, preterists take this view. They, they believe that everything's fulfilled by 70 AD, and this is all code language for God's judgment on Israel in, in uh, AD 70. And so that's the preterist view. But liberals take that view. See, Jesus was talking to that generation in front of him. None of this happened. Jesus was wrong. End of story. Poor Christians, they believe Jesus. That's just an attack on the historicity and inerrancy of the scripture. Second, and this is an interesting view because the word that is used here for generation can at times mean race or an ethnic group. And this is the interpretation that it refers to the race of Jewish people. Jesus would be saying then that um, this race i.e. the Jews, will not disappear from the earth until all of this has been fulfilled. That's true, but that's probably not the best option in context. The third option is the best, and that is that the tribulation generation that sees these things, this is the best, not those who are still in the church age who witnessed the stage setting, which was Hal's view, but this is referring to the tribulation generation. So it's after the rapture that these events that are listed from, Revel, from uh, Matthew 24, verse 4 and on take place. So that's the best interpretation. So this generation then equals the generation within Daniel's 70th week, that is those that are the tribulation generation who witness the events spoken about from Matthew 24, 4 and all. Thus, this generation shows that God's judgment had a time cap. The, as Jesus said earlier, if these days weren't cut short, that doesn't mean it's going to be less than seven years, but that seven years is a shortening of what it could have been, but if it had been allowed to go longer, the man would have completely, would completely destroy himself. So God has a time cap on the limits for this judgment. So, verse 32 emphasizes that this generation that sees these things should learn from the parable of the fig tree. This isn't talking about us. It's not talking about the church or the church age. It's, talking, it's clearly talking about this generation of the, of, of the tribulation era. They are to learn something from the parable of the fig tree. And then in verse 35... I, excuse me, I think that said verse, uh, uh, 30, it should have been 32 through 34, this generation. Then verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And what Jesus is doing here, he is comparing the temporal, unstable reality of creation that is finite to his word and to his thought that, that his word is eternal. His word is unshakable. His word is absolute stability, and that it will not ever uh, will not ever be destroyed. Heaven and earth, that is all of the universe, is finite, 
and it's not stable, but my words are infinite, and they will by no means pass away. What is he doing? He is reminding that generation that is in the tribulation that they can count on his words being true so that they can have stability in the midst of the most horrendous period of human history. They can count on his promises that he will return and establish his kingdom and that they can survive. So that takes us to the next section, verses uh, 36 to 44. But before we go on to that, I want to point out something. That the parable of the fig tree is a parable to say to show that you can, within the tribulation, see that the coming of the Messiah is near. However, you can't pinpoint it. That's what comes up in verse 36. So this next section talks about the judgment that will occur during that time and who is taken in, and who remains. Now there's more debate about that. There are two views within dispensational futurists. One is that this is talking about the rapture, those who are taken are taken in the rapture, and there are those uh, who remain. And those who remain would be, uh, if it's the rapture, those who remain are those who will go through judgment, and if it is the second coming, then those who remain are the believers, the survivors uh, of the tribulation period. Now, what throws people off is the sense of imminency that is expressed in verses 20, chapter 24, verse 36. People say, well, we don't know when the rapture is going to occur. It could be at any, at any moment. No one can set a date. Jesus seems to indicate that's what he's talking about here in verse 36. Well, if you just took this verse out of context, that might be so, but we can't do that. Of that day and hour, notice it's not just that day. If, 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 if this was an Old Testament passage talking about the day of the Lord, which had already been mentioned, it would just say of that day. It never adds this phrase, and hour. The hour indicates he's talking about something with greater specificity, not just the day, but down to the hour. Of that day and hour, he says, uh, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, there are people who ask questions about this. How can Jesus not know? Jesus, in his humanity, in his role as the incarnate Son of God during the first advent was not part of his portfolio of knowledge, did not include this in his humanity. He was uh, not to know when the, re- uh, the um, second coming would be. And he's emphasizing the, uh, that it's imminent in a sense, just as we'll see in the analogy with Noah's flood, there was a certain sense of uncertainty or imminence even at that time with the coming of the flood. You could see Noah, for example, when Noah started preaching and he, and he just laid out the, 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 the uh, basic uh, structure of the ark. You could say, well, it's going to take him a while to complete the ark. I have a lot of time. But once he completed the ark, you might say, well, I still have time. He doesn't have the animals there. And then it would take time. He gathered the animals. and then. But once Noah went in and closed the door, he might, well, this is going to happen right away. But then a day goes by, two days goes by. You don't know when it's precisely going to happen. You know it's soon, but you don't know precisely when it's going to happen. That's what Jesus is talking about here with that precision of that day and hour. No one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So this is not saying that Jesus in his deity would not know when this would happen because he's omniscient, but that in his humanity this was not part of what was given to him to know. So, And it's not talking about the rapture. Because the analogy that is given in the next few verses doesn't fit the second 
I mean, it doesn't fit the rapture, it fits the second coming. We read in verse 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. This is an illustration where Jesus is comparing the circumstances prior to the second coming with the circumstances prior to the flood. It begins with this phrase, uh, as the days of Noah in the Greek. This is the phrase hosper, which uh, compare, it's a comparative attitude, and it indicates that it is uh, in the same way, um, based on other words that are used in the text. Jesus' point is that the coming of the Son of Man is going to be exactly like the coming of judge of the flood at the days of Noah. The coming of the flood was a judgment. The coming of the uh, Son of Man to the earth is going to begin a series of judgments. So the focal point here is on judgment, not on the rescue or deliverance of believers from the judgment. And he describes the situation in verse 38, for as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And people say, well, wait a minute. If you're living in the tribulation, you've got all these prophecies telling you that it's only going to last seven years, and you can count it down almost to the day. Why would people in the midst of all of these judgments still be living as if things were normal? Well, the phraseology here is talking about the life before the flood. In the days before the flood, what were they doing? They were going th through life's normal activities as if no judgment were coming because they were suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. That's Romans 1.18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. In essence, unbelievers who are rejecting the revelation say it's not going to happen. So they're in as much denial about the return of Jesus and the establishment of his kingdom at the end of the tribulation as those before the flood were. They were in complete denial of everything that Noah said. So they were going about normal activities of life. This is the same thing that we see. People will be going to the degree that they can in those horrific times. They will be going through the normal activities of life as if there's no end of everything about to happen. They are suppressing the truth. They're living in a fantasy world. And what is happening in 38 and 39 is this focus on the normality of life before the flood. And it's going to be the same kind of thing before the coming of the Son of Man. Notice we have that phrase again, the coming of the Son of Man. Son of Man is related to his taking the kingdom, not the church. So th then it's described, the kind of suddenness that will take place. Verses 40 and 41, two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Now if we go back and we look at the description in verse 38, um, they did not know until, excuse me, verse 39, they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. Who's taken away? Noah and his family in the ark or everybody else on the earth, the unbelievers? The unbelievers are taken away. They're taken away by the judgment. So when Jesus says the two men will be in the field, one will be taken, he's taken in judgment. That fits the illustration that's given and fits the context. The other is left on the earth. He survived the tribulation to go into the millennium. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken in judgment, and the other will be left. And then he says, verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. He's not talking to the disciples about the rapture. He's talking to this generation who sees these signs. He's still talking to that tribulation generation, says, you don't know what hour. Notice he uses the tighter 
time word, not the broader word. He doesn't say what day that your Lord is coming. He says you don't know what hour your Lord is coming. Luke 12, 39 and 40 is a similar passage talking about the same thing. He says, but know this, that if the master of the house had come, what hour, had known what hour the thief would come, using this thief illustration again, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Same kind of meaning. The you there is the, the refers to the disciples, but he's speaking through them to that generation that will be in existence when the Son of Man comes to establish his kingdom. Back to Matthew 24 and verse 43 says, But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Now that thief illustration is used again in Revelation 16, 15, where we have Jesus speaking directly. If you have a red letter Bible, Revelation 16, 15 is in red letters. Jesus speaks. Now, when I taught Revelation 16, I wasn't aware, this often happens at, when, in studies as you grow and mature, that there was a whole certain web of interpretations that were grounded by a couple of different groups on an article written identifying the day of the Lord in, Revela in 1 Thessalonians 5, as imminent just as the rapture is imminent and so the author of that article says that believes the rapture is what starts the seven-year period of the day of the Lord the author of that article was Robert Thomas he takes the he's the only one who takes this view but that's his view he also has written the, arguably the best, although I disagree with him in a number of places, but it's overall the best exegetical commentary, two-volume commentary on Revelation, which I was studying through when I taught Revelation. I didn't realize that the interpretation he took of this passage was connected to his interpretation of Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now I'm aware that there's this whole whole connection. I went back, and in order to demonstrate this is what he says it is, which is what I taught when I went through this, that this is an aside to the church that, that is listening to John. In order to really prove that, you have to show that John makes these kinds of asides to his present you know, 90 AD audience more than just this one passage. I've been trying to find time to do this all week. I got up at 5 this morning, read all of Revelation. There is no other aside like this in the entire book of Revelation. That's what I was guessing, but I wanted to make sure, so I read everything through. There's nothing like that anywhere else. There's, as he says, it could be either way. He could be an aside, or it could be using the same language, addressing the tribulation generation just before Jesus comes back to say, "Keep watching, keep your garments, lest you walk, uh, lest you walk naked, and they see his shame." What happens is there's similarity here with a couple of things that are said to the overcomers in the seven letters to the seven churches. What is a primary rule of hermeneutics? Similarity doesn't mean they're identical. He violates a fundamental rule. Mr. Hermeneutics violates a fundamental rule of hermeneutics by saying that basically he argues similarity here means that it must be talking to church age believers, not to tribulation saints. And having gone through all of that, I saw some other things as well. It's very clear that this idea of a thief coming in the night, this illustration of sudden unexpectedness, is used of different things in the scripture. It's used of the rapture, it's used of the day of the Lord, and it's used of the arrival of Jesus at the second coming. So this, I think, really shows that the parable of the fig tree is a warning to, to the, the generation who sees the signs to be ready to be watching because th so they won't be taken by surprise when the Lord returns at the second coming because there'll be judgment.
Now that's what sets up the next set of parables. They're all talking about judgment of those who survived the tribulation. But you have a whole group of people in the Free Grace Alliance who have been following uh, Joseph Dillo for a while, and they're going to argue that all these coming parables talk about the church because the rapture got introduced in um, starting in chapter uh, in verse 36. The argument they always cite goes back to those articles I mentioned by Bob Thomas. But what's interesting is Thomas gives them a foundation, but Thomas doesn't believe the raptures in the last part of Matthew 24. So they have just cherry-picked what he said to go forward. Now, the reason I say that is because there are people listening to me, people who are in this congregation, for whom that information is important. Some of you are just saying, well, that's interesting. I'm glad to know this isn't the rapture. I'm going to move on, and that's fine. But there are others who've been going to pre-trip for the last 10 or 15 years, and they're a little more knowledgeable, and they want to know answers to specific questions. So I'll come back, pick, up, pick it up a little more uh, next time as we go in. I had debated within my head about whether or not to do an Easter special. I've been gone, missing this and that too much. I'm sticking with Matthew uh, 24 and 25 over the next few weeks because we're just losing too much continuity by interrupting with other things. So we'll continue with this next Sunday morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things this morning and to uh, recognize that even though this is talking about the tribulation generation and the suddenness and unexpectedness of Christ's return and the need to be prepared and ready, it has application to us because as church age believers, we're anticipating our Lord's return at the rapture, which could be at any moment. And we need to be prepared and we need to be ready. If there's anyone listening who's never trusted Christ as Savior, then you're not ready. You're not prepared. For when Jesus returns at the rapture, those who are alive will be caught up to be with him in the clouds. We will not go through the tribulation. Those who are, have not trusted in Christ as Savior will go through the tribulation, the most horrific period of, of violence and turmoil that has ever been experienced in the history of mankind. If we trust in Christ we don't go through that. doesn't mean we don't go through tribulations and testing and wars and famines and pestilences, but not to the degree that they will be experienced in the tribulation period. And we need to be ready also because the judgment seat of Christ immediately follows. We will be evaluated in terms of our Christian life, our Christian growth, our Christian maturity, our service to you. Father, we pray that we might take that to heart. That for those who are not believers, they need to trust in Christ. For those who are believers, we need to make sure that we are spiritually prepared by growing, serving you, walking by the Spirit. We pray that you would challenge us with these things this morning. In Christ's name, amen.